Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us once again for our Wednesday Dig Into Gardening session with Halt and Food. Um, today's session is going to be led by Helen. Um, but before we get started, I just wanted to give a, uh, a quick introduction to us and what we are all about, um, in case anyone is not familiar with Halt and Food. Let me just let in Dolores here, another participant. So, um, Halt and Food is all about teaching people how to grow their own food sustainably, organically, and uh, increasing the resilience within our community. So Helen, if you don't mind just advancing the slide there. Thank you. Um, so we support uh, community gardens throughout the region, whether they're neighborhood gardens or allotment gardens. We teach um, after school programs, we hold sessions like this, and we make ourselves available as a community resource for anyone wanting to know how to learn uh, to grow their own food. If you ever need to connect with us, our uh, social media information is here, Instagram, halton.food, or on Facebook or Twitter, at Halton Food. If you have any questions, you can always send us an email as well, grow at haltonfood.ca. During the session today, you can use the chat box and uh, we will answer your questions at the end. So I'll turn it over to Helen at this point. Uh, she has prepared a um, uh, just a, a short lecture on integrated pest management. So Helen, I will turn it over to you. All right, thank you. Uh, yes, so today's talk is about integrated pest management or IPM for short. Uh, but first, what is a pest? Um, a pest is any living thing that humans find undesirable. So I'm sure you've all heard when people say, oh, what's a weed? It's any weed that, it's any plant that you don't want there. So for instance, a long time ago, I had roses growing outside the side of my house. Well, they got so out of control, because I didn't prune them back then, <laughs> that when my neighbor left his house, he would get scratched every time he left. So they became a weed, they became a problem. Uh, and I wasn't that enamored with them to begin with. So it wasn't something I wanted. So same with the pest. So it competes with humans, domestic animals, your dog, your cat, or if you own a farm, your horse and sheep, sheep uh, or desirable plants for food and water. So rabbits, they're gonna eat the food out of your garden, but also Norway maples, they have a thick canopy that robs any plants underneath of water. Um, they can injure humans or animals. So think the giant hogweed that the town's always trying to eradicate. Uh, the sap from that can really harm people. It causes blisters on your skin or it can damage your eyes. Or they spread diseases to humans, domestic animals, wildlife, or desirable plants. So um, think mice, rats, they spread diseases. But so does powdery mildew, right? So if that gets on one plant, it can spread to the rest. So it becomes a pest. So integrate, integrated pest management, what is it exactly? So by definition, it is a decision-making process for preventing pests from reaching damaging levels and for determining what actions to take when the pest problem occurs. So it does not eliminate all pests, but reduce the pest population to a level which will not cause significant damage. So in short, what we're trying to do is um, like I said, not get rid of all the pests, but we're just trying to get it at a manageable level that it's not gonna cause the harm and destruction that we know it can reach. We're just trying to get it at a, at a level that we find acceptable. So um, an integrated pest management can help to provide long-term solutions to pest problems. And I'll get into this a lot more, like it's not your quick cure. Um, it protects the environment and human health by reducing the amount of pesticides. It reduces the harm to beneficial organisms that control pests. There's, uh, we talked about this last talk about those beneficial organisms that we want to encourage in our gardens that will eat or prey upon the pests that are a plague for us. Um, we want to reduce pesticide resistance. So we've heard a lot in the news about antibiotic resistance in humans. Well, the same thing. So plants um, can also get pesticide resistance. If you keep using it, 
um, and using it in the wrong amounts, especially just like antibiotics, then plants become resistant to pesticides. And then you either have to use more, which is obviously more harmful to the environment and to human health, or you have to switch and use a different type of pesticide if it's even available. Um, and it provides pest control options other than pesticides. So pesticides are absolutely the last resort. And quite honestly, I would say for the home gardener, not to use pesticides at all. And you'll see why when I get into different slides. You have to know for sure that you're getting rid of the bug that you think is the problem. There's so many insects, hundreds and thousands of insects um, in your garden and you don't want to be wiping them out because it's a whole ecosystem. If you take out one, then you don't know what it ate for, to control that population and on and on it snowballs. So, and pesticides, like you have to know how to apply it. You have to not apply it when it's windy so that it doesn't get in surrounding plants. And there's actually been studies where um, people think they've safely applied a pesticide and then their dog or cat or small child has gone out afterwards, stepped in this pesticide and come home and if it's an animal, licked its paws or its fur and become sick. Or if it's a child, it's now either tracking it into your house or they've got it on their shoes. And again, little kids touch everything. So again, they might be ingesting it. So we just, pesticide, like I would recommend homeowners not use pesticides at all. So I did show this slide last time. Um, this is for anybody who's new. So that scary guy on the left, um, the braconid wasp, he's actually the good guy. He's gonna get rid of your tomato hornworm. As I mentioned before, last week, he will inject the the eggs into the tomato hornworm and then those that bottom picture with the white nodules those are the larvae of the wasp coming out of that tomato hornworm and it will create a new cycle uh, a new generation of those wasps and we want this if you say oh that's really horrible and really disgusting and you pick up that hornworm that has all those white nodules and you throw it into a bucket of soapy water or you step on it and throw it out you're getting rid of a whole generation of wasps that will get rid of the next generation of hornworms. So you've interrupted that cycle of nature kind of evening itself out. So in order to get an effective IPM, first of all, you want to prevent in the first place. And all of these I'm going to go through in a little bit more detail. You need to have proper identification for the pests that you want to control. You need to, you need to monitor these pest levels. You need to know the threshold limit. So what, how much are you willing to sustain and damage? Are you ready to lose 10% of your crops? Um, are you just doing this for fun? And if you lose 50% of what you grew and you're still okay with that, or maybe you're not okay with even one. So if you think about a restaurant, a restaurant, one cockroach is, is the limit. Like they can't have even one cockroach. But at home, if I have 10 dandelions in my lawn, that's, that's actually really good. <laughs> if I had a thousand, then I'd be like a little less happy. Uh, we're gonna think about the methods of control and then how to evaluate that. So the reason I, am, I don't recommend homeowners using pesticides, so there are three plants here with yellow leaves. One of them is caused by a nitrogen deficiency, so just something that's missing from the soil. One of them is caused by insect damage, and one of them is caused by bacterial wilt, so a bacteria, that's my doorbell. <laughs> and if you can't tell the difference, then you shouldn't be applying pesticide because you need to know what exactly your problem is before you start throwing chemicals around. And I will actually have the answer to that a little later on. So um, prevention, so an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, as we all know, that's a very common saying. So we want to avoid the problem in the first place. That's obviously way better than having the problem and then dealing with it. So choose resistant plants when possible. There's a lot out there on the market that are resistant to powdery mildew or blight or whatever it is that's your problem in the garden. Um, avoid bringing in invasive species. So do your research. Uh, so something that calls itself a spreader, that should be setting off little alarm bells. Well, how fast does it spread? And is it native to this area? Because that might say it has nothing to eat it and to keep it under control, and it's gonna spread throughout. 
you want to manage your growing conditions. So healthy soil means healthy plants. And then healthy plants are going to be able to resist a lot of diseases, better than ones that are under stress from drought or poor soil or whatever it might be. So how do you have healthy soil? You can build raised beds, you can use containers, um, or maybe just for managing your own growing conditions, it's, it's building a fence around um, your, your plants, your garden. So I like to think of healthy soils, healthy plants. So if you think about your own health, if you exercise and eat well and sleep eight hours a night or whatever it is for you, you're gonna be a lot healthier and able to cope with stress than you are if someone who like gets two hours sleep and you have chips and ice cream all day and you never exercise, like you're not able to be resistant to a lot of things that, resilient to a lot of things that come your way. So same with soil. So first step for IPM is to be able to identify. So in your chat box, which one is rhubarb? Is it A or B? And which one is burdock, which is a common weed? So you know those little burrs that cling to your clothes or your pets when you go out for a walk? One of these is rhubarb, one of these is burdock. So in the chat room, let's see if you guys can tell me which is which. So it's, is rhubarb A or B? That'll be the question, is rhubarb A or B? And I have to find the chat box here, there we go. All right, we have, all right, you guys are pretty good. <laughs> Yes, A is definitely the rhubarb, but oops, the leaves are very similar. And I have gone for walks with people in the woods and they're like, oh, why is this wild rhubarb growing here? And I'm like, it's not rhubarb, it's fur dog. So eventually it will get those stalks with the burrs and cling to you. But that's why it's important to know what you're dealing with before you deal with it. So if you don't uh, identify it properly, um, is you're not going to be able to control the pest, right? You're not going to know if you're actually targeting a beneficial uh, insect, or you might be using an inappropriate use of harmful chemicals. Uh, so once you have identified your pest, you have to do your research. So unfortunately, gardening is not quite as easy as, you know, just throw the plant in the ground, water it, and walk away. Uh, you have to know the weeds that you're dealing with. It's an annual, biannual, uh, perennial, um, so then you know how to control it. Does it spread by seeds or underground ground rhizomes? So if it's seeds, maybe you could chop off the flowering head before it's going to spread a thousand seeds to your lawn. If it's underground rhizomes, well, it's going to be a different approach again. What is the life cycle of the insect? Um, so some insects can only be controlled at the larval stage. So if you think of those little caterpillars, that's when they're doing the most damage. They're eating all those leaves. Think of uh, cabbage moths. It's the little larvae, the caterpillar that's eating the leaves. When it's a moth, it's actually not doing anything. Um, so you need to control it at that stage. Is there a secondary host for the organism? Does the insect or does the fungus, if it's covered in mildew, does it go and live on another plant and then come back to your plant when it's, um, it, you know, like when the, as the life cycles go on? Um, do you also have beneficial organisms in, in your garden? Do you have those wasps I showed the picture? Do you have birds? Because birds eat an awful lot of caterpillars. So you need to make sure that, you know, you're encouraging the good guys to your garden. So the second stage is monitoring. So you need to regularly check the affected areas. Again, you're not just going to plant water and walk away. Go and look on the underside of your leaves and see if there's any eggs. Um, and, and see what the plant is. So yesterday I went outside and I was checking all my uh, broccoli leaves on the underside because I'm looking for that cabbage moth that's going to, eventually those eggs are going to hatch and the larvae are going to eat the leaves. So how bad is the problem? So last week we talked about flea beetle. A lot of the damage flea beetle does is cosmetic. So the plant will outgrow the damage that the flea beetle is causing. Or is it a problem that's actually going to affect the viability of your plant? Is it actually going to kill it in the end? You need to know these, the answers to these questions. How many plants are affected? Is your whole patch wiped out? Um, like blight travels very quickly. You need, if you see blight on one tomato plant, you need to get rid of that as soon as possible, or it's going to spread to all your tomato plants. How many pests are there? Um, you need to monitor also the temperature, humidity, and other environmental factors. So if we're having one of those really hot, um, always raining type of summers, 
that's going to spread a lot of fungal diseases than if we're having a really dry, hot summer. So some things are just out of your hand. Like you might say, I didn't water all summer because I didn't need to, or it rained every day. Well, that's also going to affect what grows. And then you know, okay, well, I didn't have a lot of, if you made notes, and you said, oh, I, I, I never was able to grow such and such because it just uh, it got moldy or it got uh, fungal diseases and it died. Well, was it you or was it the weather conditions? So you, you need to make notes about these things so you can make an informed decision next year. And part of monitoring is also making sure your solution is working. So if I'm rubbing off all the eggs uh, on the underside of the leaf, is that, is that working? Like, am I actually getting rid of the pest? Uh, threshold limit. Um, this is the, the this is when you're making your action. So what is the specific number of pests at which you must take action if you want to prevent the pest from causing unacceptable damage, or loss, or harm? So like I mentioned before, is it acceptable for you to lose 10% of your crops? If it is, then that's great. If not, you need to take action. Um, again, like but some things that you got to take action a little bit quicker. One bowl. As you know, like they, they breed like rabbits. They quickly become dozens when not controlled. Then you need to take action. So there's a number of different ways you can take action. So there's your cultural control methods. So that's doing your crop rotation. So it's making note of, oh, I had my tomatoes in this row um, in last year, so then I need to move them for this year. It's disinfecting your tools. So if you prune off a branch that has some sort of fungal disease, Use that uh, concentration of rubbing alcohol or um, uh, what's the other one for disinfectant? Um, bleach, a bleach solution, then you, that's what you need to do so you don't spread it to the rest of the plant. Um, you need to grow a host to encourage those beneficial insects in, and you need to water and that's a cultural control. Mechanical control meth methods, these include like physically picking off the tomato, hornworm off your tomato and putting it in soapy water or leaving it out in a hot, dry location so the birds can eat it. It's traps, it's weeding, it's, it's anything that you're physically doing something. Biological control, so that's using living organisms to control the pests, so that's like you're encouraging your predatory wasps to come in, um, or birds, your dogs and cats, maybe it's releasing your dog into the garden and scaring away the rabbits. Cultural controls. Um, this is your, the ones that are like the synthetic or natural chemicals to kill, attract, repel, or control the pest. So it can be simple as a vinegar solution. I think we had a, last week we talked about um, the rubbing alcohol, dish soap, and water solution to control some, some pests. High iron formulations are good for broadleaf weeds, but they won't kill your grass. And then um, glycophosphate, it's, it's kind of, it's very toxic. And again, I'm not gonna recommend it. I just listed it there as an example of a chemical control. Behavioral control is using the pest's natural behaviors to suppress the population. So pheromone traps. So that's using its um, pheromones or what attracts one insect to another insect for mating. So if you have these traps, um, you're gonna attract your pest into there. So that's, a, that's behavioral control. Now be very careful using those. Some people will have them for Japanese beetles, but if you hang them up, you could also be attracting all the Japanese beetles in your neighborhood to your trap. And some of them are gonna be like, yeah, I'm actually gonna go onto your rose bush instead. So just be careful when you're hanging those up. Evaluating, um, take notes of your treatments. Um, and like I've always said, make notes, notes, notes. So take notes to compare the problem beforehand and your post-treatment, so did it work? Identify, identify possible improvements. Um, so maybe your garden was too shady and it needed more sun so that it didn't get powdery mildew. Was it near a rabbit den and you didn't realize it was there and you need to move the whole thing or do something to the rabbit den? Um, so always notes, notes, notes. All right, so here's the answer. <laughs> Three was insect damage, that's actually rice. Um, number one was a nitrogen deficiency and number two is bacterial wilt, which is actually transferred through insects, but it is a bacteria that actually causes that condition. But your host is, uh, is it's the insect. So, um, and now's the time to use chat box to ask me any questions. Um, and if I don't know the answer or any of us from anybody else can pitch in on the panel, if they don't know the answer, we'll get back to you in a few days. Um, and let us know also if there's any other talks you want to hear. 
So next week, we're going to have Alison in the garden and she's going to show common things you should be doing in your garden and common thing, common pests in your garden. So she's going to do a little bit of weed identification, I believe, as well as saying like, oh, here's how you thin carrots. And then we're going to have a separate one on pruning tomatoes a little bit later. And the week at, so next week's Alison, the week after, we're going to have a special guest. We're going to have um, Mayor Gordon Krantz from Milton. He's going to be on and he's going to be talking to us about his homemade compost and how to make your homemade compost and how to um, his zucchini plants. And he's very well known for his zucchinis and he's going to tell us how he grows champion zucchinis. <laughs> so any questions basically? Right. Sarah Jane, where can I buy ladybugs to control pests? I am not too sure. My one thing though I would have to say is be very careful that you're getting the ladybugs that are native to this area. There are, in fact, some of those ladybug insects, because of cost, they actually get them. Yes, the nine spot ladybugs. If you get the ones that aren't native to this area, you're going to cause a bigger problem because they can be, they can eat our good ladybugs. <laughs> Yes, versus the Asian European. Thank you, Ali. So you want to make sure that you're getting the ones that are native to uh, this area, Canada, Ontario. I feel like I've just had a university level course on uh, integrated pest management. <laughs> you did a bit, because I did take a course on that. <laughs> awesome, I'm very thorough. Borrow Tally for <laughs> But hopefully it helps. But um, <laughs> basically, it's it's about taking notes. It's about monitoring, and it's about having an acceptable level of damage. Because with IPM, you're never gonna. The goal isn't to eradicate, because then you're knocking the whole system out of whack, right? If you remove anything from the ecosystem, it, it affects everything further down the the food chain. Absolutely. Um, the Biggest Little Farm was a, a very clear indication in that movie. That one thing affects another. Yes, and, and I don't remember if you remember the statistic. We listened to a talk by Sean James, and he's um, an amazing, um, he? he's a landscaper that designs gardens using basically native and indigenous plants. And he was saying that birds eat, what was it, like four, how many caterpillars? Like 400, they need 400 caterpillars, like per bird, to raise their young. Right. And even birds that eat seeds and nuts, and you think, well, can I just put out a thing of seeds? They don't feed their young seeds and nuts. They feed their young caterpillars. So as awful as you find it to find one on your plant, if you can, if your plant's not going to die because of the infestation, let the birds have those caterpillars. They need to feed their babies. Do you remember what the number was? It was a lot. No, I don't. Yeah, it was, it was a shocking amount that I was like, wow, how did they even find that many? <laughs> and that's another thing. If you start using chemicals, then the birds aren't going to eat. And, it, and again, that goes down the food chain or it goes down the whole like ecosystem. The food web. <laughs> Does anybody have any specific questions about getting rid of anything in their garden? <laughs> So is it good to have a bird feeder beside your garden plot? Good question. Um, I'm going to say no, simply because birds are messy and then the seeds that they spill over end up in your plot and a lot of that bird seed um, turn out to be weeds. So I think it's a Niger seed. It's actually thistle plants. Mm -hmm. Those little tiny black seeds that you feed finches. And so, you know, you if you've ever been under a bird feeder, a bird feeder, you see it like all over the place, and then you know that it's um, it's just going to get into your garden and grow into those weeds. So be very careful. Yeah, and I had a good chat with the um, um, at the bird store in Burlington. I can't remember what it's called right now, but a lot of that seed that gets knocked down to the ground then goes moldy and is potentially eaten by other animals and makes them sick as well. So he recommended the shelled um, sunflower chips that if you're going to have a bird feeder at all, that's the best one because it doesn't have the corn in it that goes um, gelatinous and mushy. 
and so you're not getting the peanuts in it either, the stuff that gets shucked and chucked to the ground. Uh, yeah, the sunflower or the millet. I prefer the sunflower chips myself, but yeah, I would say keep it away from your garden. So, um, was it Judith that was on uh, our call last week with the questions? Did you uh, test out the, I'm going to unmute you. Did you test out the uh, Now we have spray? to figure out how, if that's um, something we yes, can do. Yes, I was able to actually, uh, use uh, the try to soap it, and water right? solution on my uh, bok choy. Um, it seems to uh, reduce the amount of um, pest that's coming onto the, right. the vegetables. Um, but it's hard to say because my um, bok choy is now no. bolted, so no, I think, no, no leaves uh, growing from it. So I'm just going to leave it in the garden as is, and I planted um, peas beside it. So I'm just crossing my fingers that the peas don't get um, uh, flea beetles on them as well. Good stuff. Okay, I'm going to mute you again. Does anybody else have any uh, questions for Helen at this time? We were all a little stunned at my... Uh, <laughs> Hopefully it was good. <laughs> any other questions about any other topics that you want to put into the chat box? Tell us what you're, uh, what you're growing. Do you have any zucchini that are going to compete with Mayor Krantz's uh, award-winning zucchini plants? Yeah, because I don't think there'll be a fall fair this year, so we might all have to show our vegetables online and tell us. <laughs> Take pictures and measurements and weight. Biggest pumpkin. Yeah, I'll have to be like a little more honest though. Yeah. Little <laughs> well, fingers on the scale. <laughs> right, so next week is Allison in the garden. Oh, good. So somebody's going zucchini for the first time. Lots and lots of compost and manure. <laughs> That's the trick. Um, so obviously tune in next week, but also tune in two weeks from now because that's Gordon Kranz talking about his zucchinis. Um, so he'll give you lots of tips on that. I would say keep an eye out for that cucumber beetle so you don't get uh, any diseases. <laughs> and to keep them away, I don't know uh, how, if they're still quite small, get a row cover and cover them for now until they get their flowers when they need to be pollinated. Hmm, couple first timers. All right. Good. Maybe we'll have a, uh, a separate session just all about the zucchini with Mayor Krantz. We'll give all the tips and tricks possible. Yes, powdery mildew is uh, something that will affect the zucchini. So always water the roots of the plant, try and keep the, the leaves dry, lots of air movement to help them dry off and keep that wind uh, movement around them. If there's a bright red insect that flies around them, you wanna keep that off, it's your squash borer and it lays eggs inside the stalk which will eat the plant from the inside out. Once that happens, your plant becomes extremely susceptible to powdery mildew. I know a lot of people, when I was up at the community garden, were like, oh, my plant has powdery mildew. I'm like, oh, it has more than that. Like, it, it has this little um, caterpillar, this worm inside it that's eating it from the inside out. So are there substitutes to row covers from the store that you can use? Yes, and this is, um, we talked about this before, we can use like old um, curtains, that sheer curtains. Okay, yep. Work. Anything that's going to let the sunlight and the, uh, the water through, but keep the pests out. Yes, and try to keep the cover actually off the actual plants. So if you can have some way to kind of elevate it, like plant some sticks and have it kind of tent over the plant rather than laying on the plant. Um, yeah, as Allison said in the comment section, old white or light blue bed sheets, they tend to be a little bit heavier, so they will need support. If you have old hula hoops, if your kids are done with those, 
cutting those in half and having them as like a little um, half circle, um, create a little dome. That'll work. Yeah, it's uh, it's tough to find stuff when it's just around your house because I know everything at the garden centers are just selling out. Mm -hmm. Any other uh, veggies that people are growing for the first time and might want some introductory uh, advice for? Zucchini seems to be a big one this year. Or a scratch. <laughs> it's your first time planting it or plant it beside your zucchini? I'm not sure which. Uh... <laughs> Best structure for peas? Anything that the little vines can cling to so it can grow up. So just putting a pole, like a, a wooden post isn't enough. It, the, those little, um, I don't know the proper terminology. The little, and, yes, thank you. Needs to actually cling to something. So uh, I've used chicken wire around something and it can intertwine into that. Or you can use, um, what have you used, Andrea? I'm using string. Yes, that works. So I've got uh, posts or um, little bamboo sticks kind of down the row and I'm just drawing my strings kind of guiding them upwards and then back towards the house so that I create a kind of like a vertical slope to the way that they're growing and then I'm going to plant some things that need shade underneath. Yes, but don't plant them with something too smooth that the tendrils can't cling to. No, it's, I'm using the jute twine, so it's got those nice fibrous um, texture to it. They seem to be clinging on just fine. They didn't like my old hula hoops. Those were too slippery for them to grab, grab onto last year. Yeah, I had I have one rogue pea in my garden. I have them all in one garden. I have a couple of raised beds. So in one raised bed, I have like 10, and then another one I have a just one on its own, who knows, maybe the squirrels took it over before I, before I put the fencing up. And I tried just putting a bamboo post and that was too smooth as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've got just the really skinny bamboo um, sticks. So the tendrils seem to wrap around them okay. But you do need something for it to climb. They apparently don't grow as well if they're not climbing up something. So if you've just let them sprawl, they won't, they won't produce as much as you're hoping if it, than if they would if they climbed. Are you good, Judith? Does that give you lots of ideas? Thumbs up, good. <laughs> yes, I thought about making a pattern, but uh, with the string, as Ali suggests, but I got lazy. Yeah. <laughs> Strung them up. If anybody's a, a teacher, that would be a great idea. Yeah. Any other things that people are growing for the first time or have uh, cool things to share? Let us know in the chat box. Or what other topics you'd like to see us present? I think midsummer we're going to have a show and tell where people have to uh, show us pictures at least of what you're growing in the garden. <laughs> We'll have a photo contest. Yeah, send them to us at Grow at Halton Food and, uh, and then we'll post them. Yeah, we can uh, feature some articles in our newsletter as well. If you've had great success or, you know, uh, an abundance of harvest and you want to give some away or share a, a nice community story, please do send us your pictures. Oh, Soil one. amendment topic. Good, good call. Yep. We can definitely do that. Which is, I don't think Halton eventually ever did their um, compost giveaway, did they? No, it was cancelled for this year, so that's very unfortunate. And um, so hopefully they have one in the fall, but uh, yeah. Yeah, so we can top dress our gardens. Thanks for sharing your good news, Dolores. Glad you started your uh, first square foot garden. Hope it's coming along well. Yes, yeah, send, send us pictures. <laughs> <laughs> All right, if you have any other questions or topics, feel free to uh, send them to us at grow at haltonfood.ca. 
thank you so much for joining us today. We will sign it off here. And again, next week, Allie will be in the garden and uh, Mayor Krantz will uh, follow the week after with his award-winning um, compost and zucchini, uh, zucchini growing tips. Thank you. Have a wonderful day, everyone. See you next week.